Um, I will tell you exactly what I did for the Arnold Classic. I took uh, 25 micrograms. I think I'm going to go a little backwards here. Usually what I talk about here is um, getting ripped. Actually, you know what? Let's talk about this first. So, because this is a pretty easy discussion, really. Getting lean, getting ripped. Anybody in here want to get leaner? Some people in here want to get leaner? Everybody in here just wants to get big, huh? All right. That's okay, too. I'll keep this real short, then. <laughs> we'll spend all of our time talking about pounding pancakes, then. All right. Um, so getting ripped. Anybody know who that is? All right. Much better, at least much better than the Sentinel one where I only had one answer. Um, okay, Gambit likes to throw cards. When you look at fat loss, when you look at getting really lean, you have a lot of cards at your disposal, okay? It's very important that you play them wisely. You don't want to play them all at once. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, somebody give me something you can do to get leaner. Give me one thing. Cardio. 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 That's a card you can play. Cardio. What else? Decrease calories. What else? What was that? Drugs. Absolutely. You can incorporate drugs in your plan. Absolutely. What else? Water intake. Water intake. Yeah. 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 You could say that. Yeah. We don't want to be dehydrated and get all soft and squishy. Uh, adjust your macros. Yeah. Lower your carbs a little bit. Refeeds I absolutely can help your metabolism. So my point is, you see all these things we, we have at our disposal? What I see, the classic mistake that I see is that people play them all at once. All right, I'm starting my new program, it's New Year's. I'm gonna start with my fat burners. I'm gonna start taking thyroid. I'm gonna start doing cardio. I'm gonna cut my calories down. And it works awesome for four weeks. And then what happens? I'm screwed. I've taken on my calories already down. There's, there's nowhere left to go. So a better approach, in my opinion, is to take a little more long-term approach. And I don't even mean just necessarily a better approach of getting leaner. It's actually just a better approach health-wise. Um, so what I like to do is I like to play, you know, you want to play a card or two and then give it time to work. You know, um, I like to just, my first card I play is I just clean my diet up. I just cut back on, you know, stuff I shouldn't be eating. And that's it. That's the first thing I do. And that in itself yields really good results for me. The second thing I do is I'll add in cardio, not real hard. I might add 30 minutes, 35 minutes in the mornings. I wake up, do my cardio, take my kids to school, bring them back, and I eat breakfast. The third thing I might do is I might take my calories down. All those whole eggs, maybe I start to, maybe I start to back down how many whole eggs I eat. Or generally, what I do is I adjust carbs. But you know, so maybe the one cup of oatmeal becomes half a cup of oatmeal, or the two cups of white rice becomes a, a cup and a half of white rice, which then becomes a cup. So you get what I'm saying? We're playing all these cards. I, I want you to think in terms of because the overall strategy is what you need to understand. You just need to understand that all these things will work but get the maximum advantage, the maximum benefit before you do the next one. So, you know, you have cardio that you can do. You can manipulate carbs. I, I generally keep, um, for diets, I generally keep protein and fat pretty consistent. And I lower my calories by lowering my carbs. I'm not saying that's perfect for everybody because some people can lower their, um, some people can lower their fat. There's, the bottom line is you need to be in a caloric deficit. So I'm not saying you have to lower fat or you have to lower carbs. I like to tinker around with my carbs myself. Um, now, I don't know if you guys saw the condition I was in at the Arnold Classic, but that was, um, I was a true three point something percent underwater. Um, and I can tell you that that was egg whites and ketchup was about all I seemed, seemed like I was eating. It was miserable, it sucked. But, um, but yeah, what's that? Fat, was low, Fat, everything was low, man. I mean, literally, literally like when I had a little bit of low sugar ketchup on my eggs, I thought like I was eating cheesecake. Um, <laughs> that was the most, I mean, that was the, probably the most miserable I've ever been for a contest. 
But um, I wanted to bring a condition that people hadn't seen before because all you hear about these days is where is all the 90s condition? That's what everybody says. And I don't disagree with that. That's what everybody says. So I'm like, all right, you guys want to see 90s condition. So that's what I brought, 90s condition. Um, but generally, I like to manipulate carbs, pull them down. And then if it's extremely, like if I'm doing something extreme, then I might pull some fat down too, but only for a short period of time. Okay, some other things I think are pretty cool um, in terms of um, fat burners. Um, obviously, a lot of people use clenbuterol. I'm a little scared of it because I'm afraid of the issues you can have with your heart. But I'm not going to sit up here and lie and tell you I don't ever use it. I do use it six weeks before a contest. Um, it's something that works pretty, um, first of all, it's illegal. So um, luckily I had a bunch about five years ago. Then I, was, I just got a bunch. So I never had to buy it again. <laughs> um, but um, clenbuterol is something that a lot of bodybuilders use to burn fat, a lot of female competitors. But I would just advise, if you're doing that, just be careful with it. I think once you get above 100 micrograms and those kinds of doses, I think, you can, I think you're putting your heart at risk long term if you do it. And what happens is people compete, three months later they compete, three months later they compete, so they never really come off this stuff. And that's where you get to cumulative side effects where people start to have a lot of issues. T3 is another one. Um, I will tell you exactly what I did for the Arnold Classic. I took... Uh, 25 microgram tab on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at six weeks out. At two weeks out, I took one on Monday and one on Thursday. And at one week out, I took one on Monday and one on Thursday. So three, six, nine, 12, 14, 16, I took 16 tablets. Most people will take three or four tablets a day for 12 weeks in the high, at the highest levels in bodybuilding. Um, lots and lots of thyroid. And I've seen a lot of women in particular have a lot of issues down the road from this. They'll have coaches that'll put them on a 150 micrograms of T3, it, and I just like, it's so frustrating because I know what's going to happen. I know the woman is going to look great, but I know what's going to happen two months later and six months later and a year later, and it's frustrating. Um, so T3 is something that for very short periods of time, it's a card you can play. I would advise you if you're going to do that, just to be very, very careful. I only like to do it once a, once a year if I'm doing it just before one, one contest and that's it. Is that something you will taper back down off of or you just use it for a short period and stop altogether? So the question is, do you taper back down off a of T3 or do you just cut it cold? I, I taper it down a little bit, but you gotta real, I'm not even using hardly that much anyway to begin with. So I might like do a half a tab for a week and then for the Monday, Wednesday, and Friday and then just stop. But for the people who are doing like 150 micrograms, yeah, you want it might, you, I generally tell people to take two or three weeks off to work their dose down. Because you don't want to go from 150 to 200 micrograms a day to just boom, cold turkey. Especially then because what do people do after a show? They eat a lot. You need to taper off. What's that? You have to taper off. Yeah, so yeah, you have to taper off or you have this latency period, right? Where so we always do, we do like half a time. I, I'm most time we're going to send Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. What happens if you don't? I'm curious. Well, um, I can give Eric can give you a medical perspective of it. I can tell you what I see. I, I see rapid, rapid, rapid fat gain, and then I see really, really frustrated women because their metabolisms were just, you know, they have all this. The T3, T3. So first of all, is the active form of thyroid. When you hear people say they have, um, like, you'll hear them talk about T4, T3. T4 is just thyroxin. That's what your thyroid is producing. But there's a process. There's a, there's a process that needs to take place for your body to actually use it. And as you diet, your body, one of the ways it resists, it, it kind of holds on to fat, is it slows down that process. It doesn't convert T4 to T3 as easy. And that's a self-preservation mechanism. So what people do is they just take straight T3. They don't have to worry about the conversion. So then think about that. Now you do a contest and you stop all that. So what's getting converted from T4 to T3? What, what do you, not much, right? Because your body was like getting starved. So if you're not, you're not making that conversion happen, what's going to happen to someone's body fat level? Bam. It may not even be that high of calories. They might only take their calories up a little bit. But hormonally, they're in a position where yeah, you're in bad shape. Whereas if you kind of work your way off of it, it's a little better.
So Anything you want to add to that, Eric? Yeah, so people use P3, and they, I've seen dosage up to 300 per game in the office. I, I didn't do it, I just said they killed with that. But also, one thing you're forgetting is that some people are also lowering their fat intake as they diet. And the problem is that you need vitamin A for D3 to work. So some people, when you're taking D3 that much and say, I don't see results, it's because D3 requires vitamin A for the receptor reserve to work. So sometimes you have 25,000 and I use a vitamin A, and all of a sudden you see a rebound, I say, oh my God, I lost this much weight. So, but then you start coming up with your D3 or you stop that, and there's no vitamin A, you want to keep low fat, you see a massive rebound of gaining fat and weight. Yeah, so just, um, again, I just like to be honest with people and share different thoughts of what goes on because a lot of people fool around with this stuff and I like for him to at least try to do it intelligently. You know, hembine is something a lot of people like to use. Um, I think Dan Duchesne probably made that famous in the 80s. He was one of the first guys that talked about beta receptors and alpha receptors and clenbuterol and ephedrine worked on beta receptors, but alpha receptors which are typically located in areas where you store the most fat. So typically for women, they might have more of an uh, alpha receptor makeup in their, maybe their hips and their butt, whereas guys, it's more in their gut or love handles. Um, Yohimbine is supposed to target alpha receptors, it's supposed to affect stubborn body fat. And I think there is some truth to that. The problem with Yohimbine is it just kind of makes a lot of people feel really funky. Um, I always felt like, I always felt kind of weird when I took it. Um, but that's another card that some people play uh, is Johembine. Uh, I don't know how, how often it's in supplements now, but I assume they still put various extracts and supplements. I don't think it's illegal or anything like that. Um, in Canada it is. Johembine, really, it's illegal in Canada. Wow. Now, the thing beside it, ECA, that's ephedrine, caffeine, and aspirin. That was the old school. That's what we did in the 90s. All of us did that in the 90s. All of us that competed did the ECA stack. Every one of us. Um, ephedrine, caffeine, and aspirin, the typical dose. You would typically do it three times a day. But the ephedrine back then, um, we used to get it at, um, you go to the truck stops, like the gas stations, and it was called Mini Thins. And, man, that stuff was strong. It was really, really strong. Um, caffeine, people would take no dose and Vibrin and all that stuff. So you had these magical pill combinations. Take it 7 o'clock, 12 o'clock, and 4 o'clock. Then you couldn't sleep at night. That's a whole other story. Um, but ECA was a really, really popular fat burner. Um, some people still can get their hands on the ephedrine hydrochloride. I know a lot of people say they can go to a, a pharmacy and there's Broncade and there's another one. There's Primatine. I personally don't feel that like anything like i don't care if it says ephedrine hydrochloride on it or sulfate i don't i don't know what it says but i don't feel like i used to feel the old ephedrine <laughs> that we used to get um but it is a it is something that people do so i just wanted to put it up here to show you that's another card that people play um the next one is growth hormone uh growth hormone um here's a here, I, okay so I actually really enjoy talking about growth hormone because I think it's pretty misunderstood. First of all, the dangers with growth hormone. Most people are worried that if they take too much growth hormone, they'll get giant feet or giant elbows or a giant Andre the giant head. And yeah, does that happen? Yeah, but not very often. There's a Mr. Olympia, if you go through the pictures, that when he does his front double bicep, you'll see his elbow pointing out about that much. It's sick looking. Um, and I don't mean sick in a good way. The young kids say sick in a good way. I mean sick in a bad way. Um, but I'll just tell you this, it was in the 80s. So look up pictures of all the guys that went to Mr. Olympia in the 80s and you'll see that pointy elbow. That was from a lot of growth hormone. He actually was taking it from cadavers. They actually had cadaver growth hormone back then. They had Grom, it was called. There was Crest Corman, all those. <clears throat> um, anyways, so. Um, growth hormone, to me, there, to me, there is a danger you have to be very aware of, and that is diabetes. If you look at the insert uh, that comes with serostim um, or humotrope, these growth hormones, it'll say one of the side effects is glucose resistance. Um, that means that you, um, 
you're having trouble getting, uh, we'll just say lowering your blood sugar, you, your growth hormone actually makes blood sugar go up. You're having trouble getting glucose out of your bloodstream and either taking it into your muscle cells or your fat cells. Now, that's very important because when you constantly have, um, when, you're, when you start to become glucose resistant or the other word you hear is insulin resistant, you have all this sugar floating around in your blood in your insulin receptors, what will happen is your pancreas will say, okay, then I just need to make more insulin. And then it doesn't help. So then your pancreas says, okay, now I need to, ne need to make more insulin. Then, then what happens is around your muscle cells and your fat cells, you have these insulin receptors. And they're, so, they're getting so bombarded from all the, ins from all the, all the insulin and, and blood sugar, they desensitize and they don't work as well. And that's important because if you picture like, um, like picture this uh, 45 pound plate here, that's a muscle cell. And these, on the out, outside of here, all the cell membrane, all those insulin receptors sit there. And when they're working good, they, um, they it's kind of like a keyhole. Like <clears throat> you put a key, you put a key into the hole and turn it and a door opens and that's how you get glucose out of your bloodstream and that's how your blood sugar lowers. But when that becomes dysfunctional, that's when people can become, become diabetic. I know a lot of pro bodybuilders are diabetics now. And out of respect for them, I'm not gonna tell you who they are, but there's a lot of pro bodybuilders that are diabetics right now. And that's why. And to be more specific, I believe it's more because they're taking growth hormone multiple times during the day. Because what happens is people say, well, I'm, I always hear that if I take big doses at once, that's where I get all the side effects. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think when people take the smaller doses, but they take it frequently, that's when I see massive glucose resistance. And that's where I think you have more of a risk of becoming a diabetic. Um, what I personally think is that all this hormonal stuff works best around training. So if I were going to have somebody use growth hormone or something like that, I would have them use around training when there's all these things going on when you train with your body that you can take more advantage of it. And it's kind of in and out. But I like to bring that up because I just, I don't think people are aware of the risk associated with growth hormone. I don't think they associate it with diabetes and it's very, very real. Um, I'm not trying to scare you. And I personally think growth hormone is great if you use it intelligently. Um, but that is a card that people play. I have a question. Yes. How does exogenous insulin play with that or affect that? Well, exogenous insulin, a lot of people will say you need to actually use insulin with it. Um, that's debatable. Um, you think it makes it worse or, or does it relieve some of the strain? I think it probably relieves some of the strain. But the problem is, is insulin, man, when I think about insulin, I, I think the effect that you get from insulin is two, three, four weeks. And then it doesn't work nearly as well. And then what do people do? They use more. Do these receptors upregulate or do they desensitize? So is there more of them now because you're saturated? Or are they just not working as well, do you know? I don't know, I'm not smart enough to know that. Um, but what I would say is that, you know, if you have somebody that takes insulin, there's, insulin is a, is a uh, transporter, okay? It's moving, it can move things into your muscle cell. That's very good. It can move glucose in your muscle cell, which can become glycogen. It can really hydrate your muscles well. It's a, it can be, a, yeah, for short periods of time. What happens though is you get people to use insulin and that effect starts to wear off really quickly. And there's different theories on why that happens. The biggest, the thing that I guess that I believe is, okay, within that muscle cell, you have carrier proteins. That's where you hear about glucose transporters and they don't make as many carrier proteins as one of the answers. The, glu the glu glucose transporters also go to the surface of the cell membrane and they allow glucose to come in. So if that process isn't happening as well, then you're, again, you're in a position where you can't get your blood sugar down, you got high blood sugar. So, <clears throat> um, anyways, yes? Uh, so if you use the GH just once a day, you know, pre or post training, do you still like only want to use that for a certain amount of time? Um, yeah, you know, the, the risk with a lot of this stuff is, you know, what's it going to do to your own, own production? That's the risk. And, you know, um, I can't tell you what to do or what not to do. What I can say is that 
low doses have proven to be very safe. And if you look up any, if you look up life extension work, uh, particularly older folks, growth hormone and testosterone have tremendous value for people. Now, a guy like you, that you probably already have good growth hormone levels, then you're probably putting yourself at a little bit of a risk. Maybe your pituitary will act a little differently if you keep doing it. I mean, that's definitely a possibility. But as you get older, the older, older folks, man, this stuff actually becomes, it can become very healthy, I mean, very good for you. It's good for your joints, um, good for getting visceral fat out of your body. I mean, there's a lot of benefits to it as long as it's done under the supervision of a really good doctor. The only problem is there's not a really good, there's not a lot of really good doctors that understand this out there. Um, <clears throat> there's one here, but I won't tell you who he is. Okay, um, refeed meals, and this is something that people love to talk about too. Oh, one more question. Have you had any athletes that have had success with like the growth hormone security dogs, like the MK5077 or any of those ones? I lost track of those, man. So the question was all these, um, you're not, are you talking about the peptides or not? You're not even talking about the peptides, are you? MK501517, like, you know, those uh, SARMs. Well, I guess it's a those are different. Those are, yeah, those are a little different. Those are different. The SARM stuff, I'm going to be honest with you. The SARM stuff, I don't know much about. I understand the theory that it's supposed to increase androgen receptors and all that, but I don't, I'm not smart enough to know if that happens or not. I don't know. The peptides absolutely can work. Um, there's a ton of information out there. You know, look it up on the growth hormone releasing peptides. I mean, there's, there's you know, probably GHRP2 and 6 and Ipamorlin and all that stuff and use Sermerilin with it or the CJC. I don't want to bore everybody in here by getting into that. And plus, it's a little over my head. Um, but that stuff definitely works and it definitely creates natural pulses where your pituitary produces its own growth hormone but i wouldn't necessarily compare it to real growth hormone but that's that's not necessarily a bad thing though because you what a lot of people do is they stop taking growth hormone the the you know the um human growth hormone they, they stop taking that and then they take the peptides to create their own pulse naturally and i think that's probably a really good thing did you burn out your pituitary doing that if you were like too long or is there i don't think there's enough science i don't think there's enough science out there to really determine um, there's some out there for sure, but I've never heard of, I've heard of GH bleed, they call it, and some other things that are potential side effects, but I haven't personally read anything where somebody's pituitary cracked because they took too much GHRP6. So it, that's it's still really new, I think. I mean, people have been using peptides for, I'm trying to think when I started hearing about them. Um, maybe six years maybe roughly but i remember everybody was all excited we've we've got these we've isolated these particular amino acid sequences where we don't have to worry about side effects and and everybody was all excited and everybody thought man this is going to take the sport to a whole new level i don't think it did personally um i don't see an improvement in the physiques over the last five or six years it was right after the pro hormone box okay Remember, the pro hormone was huge. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there was like the Andrustine and all that stuff, and then this stuff followed that. Yeah, about two years after that, from the peptide stuff. Really yeah. I don't know. I just want to say like 2,000 Well, you know, and so yeah, so there, a lot of this stuff is really I just find it fascinating because a lot of people think they take IGF-1. Okay. How much would you guess, Eric? How much would you guess a little bit of IGF one cost, like real IGF one? Well, you know, IGF is just so cheap compared to normal. I mean, I, I wouldn't use IGF one because it bypasses the liver. At least when you ingest growth hormone, it makes other things that protects you from doing the side effects of the growth hormone. IGF one bypasses the liver, goes directly into what it's supposed to do. But I've never seen. Well, and it's not real. It was a point I was getting at. The real stuff is the real stuff is called Increlex, and there's a guy from France that supplies all the pros that use it. Um, we all just know him. I've never taken it, by the way. We all just call him Mr. Increlex. Um, but IGF-1 is, um, as Eric said, it's a little scary because your body um, can produce binding globulins to keep, 
you know, growth hormone and IGF-1 cause cell proliferation. So that means if you have some bad stuff in there, that can proliferate too. And the nice thing about growth hormone is that it, you can at least produce some binding globulins that keep it in check. But with IGF-1, there's no binding globulins. Man, that stuff would just go wild. So if you have any genetic predispositions to like maybe cancer, or, it's risky. And to me, that's a, everybody in my family is pretty much freaking dead by now. So it's not worth it to me. It's really, really expensive too. Um, okay, refeed meals and okay, this is um, I'm going to throw in cheat meals here too. Refeed meals and cheat meals. I think this stuff is really critical on a diet. And I hear people say, "Ah, you're not hardcore if you do refeed meals. All we ate was chicken and rice." I beg to differ. Um, when you get someone deep into a diet, their body is is responding. It's holding on to fat as a survival mechanism. And you can only cut calories so much. You can only do so much cardio. And your body, have, have you guys ever met anybody like that? Or has it happened to you where you just hit a brick wall? And it's not for lack of effort. You've cut your calories. You've, you've increased cardio. It's not for lack of effort. It's not because you're not trying. It, that's your body saying, I can't do anymore. So my opinion, these refeed meals and days have a lot of value because they tell your body, Whew, okay, I'm not starving, I'm not in starvation mode, it's okay to resume normal activity. Um, so first of all, just from a general perspective, I think refeed meals and days when applied properly are very effective. Um, the question becomes, when do you apply them? And how big are the meals? What kind of meals are we talking about? What are the specifics you can apply? So I tend to think they work best when somebody, the deeper you get into a diet, the more deprived your body is, the more it's trying to hold on to body fat, the more value that the, the, these refeed meals have. Now, if you start your diet, you're at your first, end of your first week of dieting, you feel great, and you're still eating a lot of calories, do you really need a refeed meal? Probably not. You're three weeks out, you're down to 1,600 calories, or maybe if you're a female or even lower than that, you're already doing 90 minutes cardio a day. Um, would it do you any good? Yeah, it might. It might. Your body. And what happens, you see, this is where you defy the laws of science. Because how many of you have done a cheat meal and woke up lighter the next day? Look at that. Like everybody in here. So you tell me how, I mean, this, there's something that's going on from this bolus of calories from getting that temporary surplus that turns some machinery on in your body. Okay, because a lot of people will argue, they say, nah, it's impossible. Um, but the body is really unique. And this is why I don't get tied down to any certain beliefs in anything, really. Because our bodies are so unique that you have to really be looking for these kinds of things. Um, I, can, I can, like, work with, um, I do this a lot with females. When they're beat up, I'll just tell them to stop training for two days and stop doing cardio for two days. And then the third day, all of a sudden, their bodies look better, they're tighter, they're harder, they feel better. Now, that defies logic, right? Logic would say you've got to burn calories and you've got to train. Sometimes you have to defy logic and be creative and understand the body needs a break or it needs more food or it needs a mental break. Mental breaks are huge. Um, mental, the mental part of this is massive, and particularly, particularly as it pertains to sleep. Most people who compete will tell you at some point of the competition, of the preparation phase, their sleep will be impacted and they can't sleep. That's a bad, bad sign when that happens. That when people don't sleep, there's a, I mean, elevated cortisol, they're not recovering as well. Now all of a sudden, with their calories, now their diet's messed up even more because they're awake longer. So, um, but anyways, my point is these refeed meals and these cheap meals, they do have value. So don't let anybody tell you that, oh no, you should never have a cheap meal. Now let me back up and take an even bigger perspective on this. Um, I have people that uh, I work with that'll come to me and they'll say, well, my last trainer wouldn't let me eat any chocolate. What do you think? I'm like, well, do you love chocolate? Yeah. I'm not gonna take chocolate away from that girl, okay? Here's what I think. The first thing you think about is you think about a 90-10% rule. If 90% of your meals are what we would call clean, I don't like to use that word, but we'll just call it clean, and 10% is a little fun food here and there, 
how likely is that person going to stick to their diet compared to the person who does 100 zero? The person who's doing 100 zero, that she can't have anything she wanted, eventually she's going to implode. Or yeah, it'll probably turn into 70-30s. Now, like if somebody told me, you're not having any more donuts, I would say, screw you, buddy. <laughs> I like donuts. I'm going to eat donuts every Sunday morning, and there's nothing you're going to do about it. You know, so, but the reason why I tell you guys that is because I think that, again, if the, lar- if the l- large portion, say 90% of your meals are clean, you should be able to have fun. You should be able to enjoy yourself. How sucky is it that you can't go out with your spouse and have a nice dinner once a week? That's pathetic. I mean, I remember when I was in my early 20s, I would go to the buffet with my friends and I would take cans of Starkiss tuna with me because I was so hardcore. That was stupid. You know, I mean, I t- particularly people with families, you have kids, you know, if you have a spouse, or maybe you're not even married, your boyfriend or your girlfriend, um, or you're, maybe you're not even married, maybe you're single, but your friends want to go out, you got to have some time to enjoy life, because if you just make yourself miserable, like this stuff just sucks. It's no fun anymore. You know, there's such a psychological impact. You know, you, you have somebody who's, say, very social, and then all of a sudden you tell them, sorry, you can't go out with your friends anymore on the weekends. That just sucks. But I hear people saying that. I hear people say, well, that's hardcore. All right, well, do what you want. But I'm going to tell my people they're going, to have, they're, they're going to have to be able to enjoy life a little bit too. Now, there are, don't get me wrong, there are times you have to buckle down. Like I was telling you in my Arnold Classic prep, it just seemed like I was eating egg whites and ketchup. There are times when you have to buckle down and be miserable. But as a sustainable lifestyle, that is just not realistic. Okay, so I always, I always like to tell people that because I think, and I think because a lot of people get taught that they can't have certain foods and the foods are bad. And I'm not saying donuts are good for you. I'm just saying I like them and I'm going to enjoy them. And, or I'm going to go out with my wife or my kids and we're going to get ice cream because I like the social benefit of having a meal with my family and my kids. And you're not going to take that away from me. And guess what? I'm still always the guy that shows up in shapes and show. Or it shows up, it shows in shape. So you can't say, well, Meadows never shows up in shape. Yeah, I do. <laughs> you hardcore guys are the ones that are bloated, not me. <laughs> so, um, but I just want you, it's just an overall general. I just want you guys to think about that. Don't think that you have to live in a cave and be a hermit and don't socialize. You know, don't um, alienate your families because... Most of us have probably done that to a degree, and we've learned the hard way. Um, I've certainly done it myself. All these lessons that I've learned, um, most, of them, most of them I've learned because I've made mistakes myself. So have a life is my point. Just be reasonable. That's all. Just be reasonable. Um, in those refeed meals and refeed days, okay, now we're getting beyond the psychological benefit. Those actually have physiological benefits. So when you're deep into a diet, that little calorie jump, might actually spur your body to pick up, it's pick up the metabolic pace a little bit. You might actually get leaner. We see it over and over and over. So how do those meals look? I can give you like some general guidelines of what I like to do. Um, it depends on the person. Let me give you like some types and let me tell you like what my thought process would be. So if you have someone who is um, super, super, super depleted, they feel awful, they can't move, they can't train, I'm probably going to give that person what I call a classic cheat meal or two, which means, you know, they can have pizza, they can go have a hamburger and fries, they can have milkshakes. Basically, I don't really put any limitations on it. I just tell them, don't make yourself sick. You know, just use, use reason. If you're going to have pizza, eat two or three slices, not a whole pizza. If you're going to get a hamburger and fries, just have one hamburger and fries. So it's something that's just reasonable, but I don't really, I'm not telling you, you can only have 100 carbohydrates, you can only have zero. Enjoy yourself, enjoy yourself. Now, if it's somebody who's, um, I think could use a little bit of a metabolic bump, but they're doing good, their strength is good, they're holding up well, then that person, I might give them a refeed meal that's a little different. I might just say, I want you to increase your carbohydrates by 200 grams today, 
Um, and you can have as you can eat whatever you want for the carbohydrates, but keep your fat really low. So they might have um, rice checks cereal, or they might have rice crispy treats. But there's a little bit more. Um, I, I've got. I'm, I'm raining that in a little bit. So there's a number. I'm telling them you can have 800 extra calories today, 200 grams of carbs. Um, Stewie knows this. We what we do is we do. We were rotating. We we're doing like a plus 50 or a plus 100 or plus 150. What I was doing is I was looking at him, and I was just looking at his body, and I was trying to determine, okay. And I was asking, how are you feeling? How's your strength? How's your pumps? And based on what he would tell me, I would say, okay, I think we could use an extra 100 grams of carbs today. And what did I tell you? Pretty much put them wherever you want. Um, spread them out. Um, so there's a couple different, um, and people really get into the science on that. People talk about how to really achieve um, a leptin spike that you can't really have fat with it. And, I don't really try to overthink these, this, this part of it. I just think extra carbs, unless they're super, super depleted, then it's more of a full all out cheat meal where they can have fat and carbs. That's kind of my easy way of looking at it. Does that make sense? You might be able to touch on this already, but I have questions about uh, pre-post. Uh, do you, how, how do you work fat into that into the equation? Do you have no fat? Okay, so I, okay. Um, Now, the thing that I think I'm probably known for the most uh, nutritionally is this whole what do you do around training window with your nutrition. And I have very strong beliefs on that. Um, so um, if you remember what I mentioned uh, uh, probably 20 minutes ago was I said recovery is extremely important. You have to be able to recover from your training sessions, and the better your recovery is, the more you can train. So I believe that recovery is best impacted by what you consume around training. And I'm gonna to explain to you why. Some of it I feel pretty good about from a scientific perspective. Some of it I feel pretty good about, but more from working with clients and seeing it's more from an anecdotal perspective. So I'm gonna tell you what I do generally, and then um, we'll go from there. So generally, Here's what I think about a pre-workout meal, how it should look. I think it should have some easily digestible protein. So I wouldn't have somebody eat a steak 20 minutes before they trained. I'd rather they have some whey protein or something that they digest really easy. That would be their protein source. I don't go sky high on that. Like with men and men, it might be 30 or 40 grams. With a woman, it might be 20 to 25 grams. Nothing crazy, okay? Now. Carbohydrate piece. I like for somebody to ingest carbohydrates before they train. Now, does it need to be a ton? Do they need to load? No, I don't think so. I don't think it's necessary. And I'll tell you why, and this will make sense. Um, so I might have a male have 30 to 40 grams of carbs. Um, same thing as a protein, and I might have a female have 20 to 30 grams of carbs. So pre, this is all pre. Now, what kind of carbohydrate should it be? Whatever agrees with your body. Um, if you feel really good eating oatmeal, fine. If you feel really good eating rice, fine. You want something that's not going to sit in you like a lead balloon, obviously. Okay, so this is, and I'm not advocating these massive carb meals before you train, but I am advocating getting carbs in your body, and I'm going to tell you why. This relates directly to recovery, because what does your pancreas do when you eat carbs? Insulin. And, and insulin has a very, very strong effect on recovery. It's very anti-catabolic. See, when you guys are hearing about all these nutrient timing studies, have you ever noticed all they talk about is protein synthesis? They only talk about one side of the equation. They conveniently forget about the other side of the equation, which is muscle protein breakdown. See, to, whether you're gonna gain muscle or, not, muscle or not is completely dependent upon this equation. You have muscle protein synthesis and muscle protein breakdown. If muscle protein synthesis is here, then you can gain muscle. But what if muscle protein breakdown is here? Are you gonna gain muscle? Probably not. Now, the beautiful thing about insulin that is achieved by eating carbohydrates is it manages that muscle protein breakdown. Now, we're gonna take another step further, but that is one reason why I like to have some carbohydrates before training. Because I want insulin in your body when you're training. And what else did we say insulin did? It shuttles nutrients. 
So when you take some amino acids or you take some uh, creatine or whatever you're taking, you're always going to be able to drive it into muscle cells better when insulin is present. That's what it does. Um, I used to have in my slides a picture of the transporter, and I called him insulin. Uh, what's his name? Jason Statham. Um, okay, now, so that's carbohydrates and protein. Now let's talk about fat. Most people will tell you not to eat fat before you train. I like for you to have a little bit. 10 grams for a guy, which is one tablespoon of peanut butter, and 5 to 10 for a woman. Now, why in the world would I want you to eat fat before you train? Keep your blood sugar from crashing. Keep your blood sugar from crashing. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much right. I want to stabilize that insulin. So we didn't, we didn't eat a ton of carbs and get this massive spike. We just ate enough to get it elevated. And now we added some fat in to keep it steady. Now, how does that happen? Well, fat controls how quickly glucose enters your bloodstream. And how quick, I mean, it, can, it just, it controls, uh, you, it controls that spike. So you don't get spike. It just levels everything off. Okay, that's why when you eat fatty meals, it takes longer to digest too. Um, so that's what we've done. We've we put, and the other thing about carbohydrates is it's a good good source of what energy. <laughs> it's a good source of energy. It's a, it burns your body uses carbohydrates very well for energy. Okay, so we have a little good digesting protein. We have some good digesting carbs, and we have a little bit of fat. We don't have this meal that's going to make you big and bloated. You're going to have it maybe 60 minutes or maybe 40 or maybe 20, depending on how quickly you digest your food. You have to experiment and find what's right for you, but you don't want to go into a workout hungry. Um, now, you also have to keep in mind as I'm speaking that I really think my mind is really wired around hypertrophy. So I'm always thinking about how can I put muscle on people the most. Okay, this is why I don't like training fasted. This is because those kinds of things will directly impact how quickly you can put on muscle or eliminate the ability to put on muscle. Okay, so now we get to the workout. Um, now what do we do? I think some of you know that I'm an advocate of intra-workout nutrition, and I want to give you a little context on that. I don't think that it applies to everybody equally. I don't think intra-workout nutrition is for everybody. What I do think is the harder you train and the more volume you train with, it gains value. And that's number one. Number two, there is an unquestionable benefit to recovery if you're using certain nutrients. I, this is one thing that um, I think you guys know I believe in branch cyclic dextrin as a carbohydrate source. If you look at the studies on it, it's done on, they, they feed it to mice and throw them in the water and the mice who have consumed it can swim longer and they give it to endurance runners. That's not really very convincing for, as a, for a bodybuilder. That doesn't convince me at all. But when I started using it with bodybuilders back in 2012, the story was the same with 90% of the people. Like, man, I'm not getting sore anymore. How am I recovering so fast? There's something about how, and, and the other thing is, and Eric has been a big proponent of this, amino acids. There's something about taking very digestible, where your body doesn't need to do anything with it, shove it in your bloodstream, amino acids and a carbohydrate, and what I believe the best is cluster dextrin. There's something about the impact of recovery that provides. And when you're training, you're digging a ditch. You're increasing that muscle protein breakdown. But if you're managing that, if you're managing that, then all your chances of being higher, of having higher protein synthesis are greatly increased. If you train really hard and you kill yourself, you might dig that ditch six feet deep. But if you're properly using intra-workout nutrition, you might only dig it one or two feet deep. So now it becomes much easier, easier to get on uh, net protein accretion is what we'll call it, you know, where you can actually grow. So I'm a firm believer that we, now, does it make sense for like an Olympic lifter or somebody just doing some speed work? Does it make sense for them to pound a bunch of aminos and carbs? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Um, but the benefit to me, and people are always saying, all you really need is positive nitrogen balance. That is not true. I have had people eat and eat and eat and they still get sore as hell. But when I put the nutrients, the amino acids in there, essential aminos, and I give Eric credit for that because everybody else was talking about BCAAs and he was one of the first ones that was talking about his, the whole spectrum, essential aminos. When you put essential aminos with a carbide, that's when recovery is skyrockets. You train much, much more. Um, 
I, I like to get a little crazy with it, you know. Um, you know, for a guy like you, I might, you might have 30 grams. I, I probably might have 20. Most guys would do. Workout. Oh, this is during the workout. But throughout the course of the workout. Yeah. Now, well, I tell you what I do like is I do like to start drinking it and getting it in your blood before you train. Because you remember what we were doing in that very first phase of training? We were delivering blood to the muscle. Now, what happens if that blood has got all those nutrients in it? Yeah, now we're delivering the good stuff. The pioneer of all this, by the way, is Milo Sarchev. I give every, I don't, I mean, I haven't, rented, I haven't reinvented the wheel, and I, I refuse to take credit for that. Milos was the guy, and he called it empty blood. He said, you know, if you have empty blood, you're missing out on the benefit, whereas if you would have had aminos in it and all this, then it would have provided a lot of benefit while you're training. So <clears throat> I do, I'm a big believer in that. And... No, so what I would, you know, for a guy, maybe 30 to 70 grams, depending on how hard the work, like a leg workout, you might want 70 grams, but an arm workout, you might just want 20 or 30. Um, basically half that for a female. Um, aminos, 20 or 30 for a male, half that for a female. And always remember, when you're trying to think about how much am I going to use, think about how hard the workout's going to be. The harder workout you need more, the less harder workout you need less. So. In other words, I call that common sense, all right? Um, does that make sense to everybody? Now, um, I do not, uh, I'm not affiliated with a company as of today, so I can't tell you where to go and buy it. Um, I've had some bad experiences. I'll give you guys some inside information. Cluster, 15 minutes? 10, 15. Okay, cluster dextrin is, um, you can't, you can't do it. You know how you hear all these companies now saying, oh, we got to test our stuff and make sure it's good. And hopefully I've played a role in that. You can't detect cluster dextrin. So um, there's what they call a reference standard. And I've been in the process of getting various products tested for various things. And the two best labs in the United States, neither one of them can detect cluster dextrin. So all I'm saying is when you get it, you might, you might even want to get it from somebody who just sells cluster dextrin by itself. Because I think that what's getting put out there in products, I think you can probably question it. Cluster dextrin, by the way, is extremely expensive. It's the most expensive carbohydrate. In the formula that I made, the cluster dextrin itself cost me, it increased the cost of the unit four to five dollars a unit, just that one ingredient. And I consider anything over a dollar unit to be an expensive ingredient. And it drove the cost up four to five. I mean, so it's an exp so what will happen is manufacturers will put trash in there and they'll just lie to you and say it's cluster dextrin. So just be careful, guys. I mean, this, the supplement industry is kind of shady, it's very shady in a lot of ways. So, yes? I might have missed it. So that's different than cyclic dextrin? Cluster dextrin and branch cyclic dextrin is the same thing. Okay. They're just different terms. It's not the same as a cyclodextrin, but um, okay. So that's what I think, intro workout. Yes? Yeah, let me talk about, okay, let me go, let me go back because that's a great question. The question was where do you cut carbs from if you're carb cycling? Going back to this, are getting ripped. Let me tell you how I like to change the carb. Remember I said I like to adjust carbohydrates and get people leaner? I, that time around training is sacred to me. I don't want to compromise the quality of my workout. So what I'll do is I'll pull carbs out of meals that are away from the workouts. So if you're training at 10 in the morning, then I might pull carbs out of the 5 o'clock meal in the afternoon. If you train at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I might pull carbs out of your meal at 10 o'clock. I try to pull carbs from the furthest away from the workout is where I try to pull carbs from. You need to do everything you can to keep your workouts as awesome as they can be, no matter what your goal is. If you're trying to gain strength or muscle or if you're trying to lose body fat, it doesn't matter. You want to have the best workouts you can possibly have. That's the bottom line. So always think in, your, think in your mind, okay, I'm going to keep the integrity of my nutrition around my training, but I do need to, but if I am going to cut some calories, just think, okay, it's going to be away from that. Make sense? That's a very easy to implement concept that you guys can use yourself or with clients that works really, really well. And it's really cool when they can actually, that might be the only part of the day where they have energy, but when they need it, they have it. All right. Post-workout training. Now, yes. I do not consider that a workout. Now let me tell you why. The question was, do, do I have a specific 
do I have specific nutrition guidelines around cardio? Is that a workout? No, and let me tell you why. Because when you're training the muscle with, with resistance, that creates that process I was talking about of GLUT4 translocation, the, the carrier proteins that get glucose into your, um, in, out, of, out of your blood and into your muscle. Um, when you were eating carbohydrates, your pancreas produ was producing insulin. None of that stuff is happening around cardio. So there's really no window, there's no opportunity to take advantage of. No, 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 fasted weight training. Fasted cardio, I just, I just can't imagine somebody would like to eat a meal and then no cardio. How could that even possibly feel good in your stomach? Um, now, do I think you need to be fasted? I don't really have strong feelings one way or the other. Well, I can tell you what, I, I do have essential aminos before I do mine. Part of that's just because I want something that tastes good and I want some hydration and some liquid and some electrolytes though. But I don't, you know, people like, oh, do I, can I take five grams of BCAAs or essential aminos? Of course you can. We you think you're going to get fat from five grams of branch chains, you know? But, oh, well, it drives your leucine, will spike your insulin. Okay, well, look at the magnitude of the insulin spike and the duration, okay? You shouldn't be worried about that. So if you want to have some aminos before you do your cardio, I'm all for that. I, I wouldn't have a big meal, though. I mean, I just, I can't imagine having a real good cardio workout when you just had a big meal. So, okay, uh, post-workout nutrition. Now, the thing about post-workout nutrition is everybody always says you've got to get your fast digesting protein and carbs in as quick as you can. Well, in the scenario I just described, no, you don't. You just address that while you were training. So if you were addressing that and you were pushing those nutrients while you're training in your, in your uh, blood and in your muscle, is there really a rush? I don't think so. Now, if the context of the situation was I was fasted or I was basically on an empty stomach, then yeah, I would say, okay, yeah, you probably want to get some real fast digesting protein and carbs in you as quick as you can. But if you're using that intro workout strategy, there's no rush. I tell people just go home, relax, and eat a meal when you're ready. It's no big deal. Again, common sense, right? So we make a lot of this stuff, a lot of this stuff is just we make it, we just don't think through, think through it logically. I just try to think through it logically.